Yeah, thank you, Clemens. So uh, it appears I'm the only experimentalist talking uh, today. So I apologize already now. I have almost no equations in this talk, uh, mostly uh, colorful pictures. Uh, this talk will basically, since I'm from Zarm, from the drop tower, and some of you had the tour this morning together with me, so I will kind of continue the tour here a little bit and give you a brief overview on the experiments on the topic of code atom interferometry that we do here at Zarm. Yeah. So, a few words on the group. So, we are a small group here at Zarm that uh, works on code atoms in the drop tower specifically. Uh, we do that not alone. We have a number of collaborators from different universities, mostly within the Quantus collaboration. And uh, many of you are from Hanover, and you know maybe the Quantus collaboration. Ernst Hasel is the uh, PI of that, and is led by Leibniz University in Hanover. And uh, many of the people down here have contributed, of course, to what I'm going to show in the next uh, couple of slides. We heard about atom interferometry from Clemens already before, so I will kind of repeat a few uh, sentences on that again. So here is another way of showing a Mach Zehnder interferometer. This is assembled from some experimental data that we took on ground from the Quantus One apparatus. This is a picture of a BEC snapshot, and then we take a picture every millisecond, let's say, along different points in the sequence of a Mach Zehnder interferometer. We split the Bose Einstein condensate, send it along to uh, beam paths and then uh, look at the interfer interference here. And why we do this as an experimentalist? Well, you can build very sensitive sensors for gravitational, for inertial sensors, uh, 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 forces from such matter wave interferometers. And I want to illustrate this a little bit for the example of the gravimeter here, for example. Uh, we use laser pulses to do this splitting, and uh, so Clemens introduced that before, you can use Bragg pulses, so what I show today is mostly based on Bragg pulses and also Bloch oscillations, which were also mentioned already, uh, to create a coherent superposition of your uh, atoms here, and then you redirect it with further laser pulses to get constructive or destructive interference, and from the output here, uh, from the number of atoms detected in the output, you can then determine the phase that accumulated between the two paths. Here. Uh, now, the thing is, at the interaction at each laser uh, beam, you imprint the laser phase basically on your atomic uh, wave function. And the laser phase is the wave vector k times the drop distance in this gravimeter here. So take k times z, z scales with g t squared. So you get a phase difference k g t squared in this case. And why is this interesting? So this gives you a relation between the quantity. In this case, it would be the gravitational uh, free-fall acceleration, and the phase of the interferometer that you can determine very precisely. And the scale factor now, first of all, it can be very large. For one second, you end up with a number of 10 to the 7 around here. Secondly, you can scale it by increasing t, and this will be the reason why I talk about the drop tower experiments later on. Yeah, you go to more longer free-fall times, you can get a really large scaling. And another very important point is uh, and that's actually one of the, uh, well, the, the important point is the scale factor is very stable. It's intrinsically known. It's the same for all devices. Yeah? It's determined by essentially the frequency, and the frequency is determined by the atomic properties. In our case, it's rubidium that we are using, and uh, the pulse separation time. Frequency and time are the two quantities that you can measure the most accurate in physics. And so essentially this is something you don't need to calibrate and you can measure it, it's very stable. And this gives rise to uh, a sensor that has essentially no, no drift compared to a classical instrument, for example, a spring gravimeter where you have a mechanical spring or something that ages that you have to calibrate. This is the big advantage here, for example, together with the huge scaling you can get here. Yeah. This has a lot of Real-world applications, I have just a few examples here. For example, people have used such devices, atom interferometers, on board of a plane. This is a gravimeter on board of a plane, and it was used over Iceland by a French group here from Onyara to do gravimetry uh, of, a, of, of a glacier, or a buffer glacier here. There are commercial devices. Or if you have a drift-free accelerometer in this case, uh, that's very interesting for inertial navigation. Yeah. For long-term navigation without drift, you can... Uh, do navigation more accurately than with a classical drifting sensor. So this is the practical things. Uh, 
you and also me, myself, are of course uh, very interested then also in fundamental physics applications and a few have already also been mentioned by Clemens before. You can use atom interferometers to do precision tests of the universality of free fall by comparing two species uh, in your atom interferometer. You can look at uh, macroscopic quantum superpositions. Markasiewicz has created in a 10 meter setup here a superposition with a distance of 50 centimeters in between. Uh, there are plans to use them in gravitational wave detectors. Uh, tests of modified gravity chameleon fields have been done. And uh, uh, clock interferometry has also been mentioned already before, so I will also maybe say one brief thing about that later on. Good. Now I mentioned the scaling with T squared as a motivation to do this in space and to do this in zero gravity, where we have access to longer free fall times and to go to seconds or beyond seconds uh, uh, free fall time in these instruments. Yeah. And this has motivated our efforts here that we started in the Quantus collaboration, uh, this collaboration by six universities uh, with uh, the Leibniz University and Ernst Rasen in the lead and it's funded by the German Space Agency and a lot of this takes place then here at the drop tower which we can see something uh, of it uh, down here. Yeah. So I talked about the drop tower this morning already. So it's 110 meter drop distance here. We have to evacuate this to uh, 10 Pascal roughly and then we have a residual uh, decel uh, acceleration in here at the level of 10 to the minus 5 and then we capture everything inside this big uh, container filled with styrofoam particles. Everything undergoes a deceleration of 30 G and the evacuation takes about 90 minutes so you have to wait for one and a half hours and then you recover your experiment which takes again half an hour or so and that limits the number of drops we can do to three per day. Uh, to improve on that, we have another smaller facility here, which is essentially uh, an elevator, an elevator system that you can move actively up and down. And then inside the elevator, you can place the same experiment in the drop capsule. You can place it in here, and then you can have it as a free flyer in the elevator. Uh, this is limited in size. You have seen it this morning, or some of you have seen it this morning. Uh, to 16 meters, which gives us access to 2.5 seconds. Yeah. Um, this is very useful for us to do some parameter search yeah, for our, the creation of our uh, interferometers in the beginning. Yeah. And since we don't have to evacuate here, and uh, uh, we don't have to wait for this 90 minutes, so we can do many hundred, in principle, many hundred repetitions uh, per day on this. Yeah. And once we have established the right parameter set, we can then move to the tower and go to the longer uh, interferometry times. Okay. Now, these are the two facilities we have here. Um, now I want to talk about the experimental setups we have. We have one, two, three uh, running BC experiments at the moment here. And the fourth one, we have uh, plans for that, and we are currently setting uh, this up, and I will mention a uh, few things about each one of them in the next few slides. So I start with our current uh, workhorse, let's say, the Quantus II uh, chip BEC capsule, which is the one that uh, is operating right now. You saw it this morning, maybe on the uh, uh, gravity tower uh, in operation. So this is... Uh, Bose-Einstein condensate apparatus uh, that is based on evaporative cooling in a magnetic chip trap. So you see the uh, chip inside an ultra-high vacuum chamber and this is loaded from a 2D uh, preparation chamber essentially. It is in here inside a magnetic shielding and then we have uh, laser systems for cooling and current supplies and computer and batteries, uh, everything on board to run the, uh, uh, the apparatus here. Um, as I said, the heart of this is a magnetic chip trap, which allows us to uh, provide a very versatile uh, magnetic uh, trap in which we can load our atoms at a couple of uh, microkelvins from a molasses here, 40 microkelvins, 10 to the 9 atoms. Uh, we load into the IPT, I of Pritchard trap in the magnetic chip, and then we evaporate with this uh, trap very fast within 1.5 seconds down to a tiny BEC of on the order of a couple of hundred thousand uh, rubidium atoms in the BC here. And fast evaporation is of course the key to do experiments in this short drop time that we have in the, in the drop tower because we do all this uh, during the zero G, during the free fall. Yeah. Okay, uh, this needs to be very robust uh, if you put it in the tower. I uh, can show here 
for example, from time to time we have to uh, check the system and this is really <laughs> what we sometimes did when we saw some problems in microgravity. You can put it on this uh, springs and you can shake it. It's a, like a shaker test and while this thing is actually shaking, yeah, uh, uh, we run the sequence yeah, and we produce BC during this happens. Yeah? And it's, if that works, we know, okay, we can go to the tower and when we go to the tower, uh, well, we don't do this every time we, we, we go to the tower, yeah, but anyway. Uh, here you can see uh, how that uh, uh, how a catapult sh shot would look like. This is not from Quantus now. This is a standard uh, video that we show. Uh, this is basically how a catapult shot uh, works. You missed the catapult shot when you went to lunch this morning, so I can show it here. Maybe I show it just once more. Yeah. So you see here's the container. Here is the capsule launch, and now the container swings in. This is all these styrofoam particles, and you have nine seconds in time. And this distance here is 110 meters. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. Okay, and everything of course happens in vacuum. Good, so if you want to do interferometry uh, with Bose Einstein condensates on long time scales, uh, the key is, and this took us a long time to establish that, yeah, uh, to limit the expansion of your BC. Even a BC still has some residual expansion, and if you don't uh, do anything about that, uh, this will thin out the cloud over, let's say, two seconds, and it's very hard to detect it uh, after two seconds. So what we do here is we apply a magnetic lens. Yeah? We apply a harmonic ma magnetic trap uh, about 80, uh, after 80 milliseconds, roughly, yeah, to kind of limit this expansion. And you can see it expands, the size of the cloud expands. It would go on like this if we didn't apply the lens. If we apply the lens, we can kind of collimate the matter wave. Yeah? So this is a collimation of the matter wave we can see. And we can do this in three dimensions with some tricks. And uh, if you consider this like it was a, a thermal gas of atoms, which it isn't, but if you consider this like it were a thermal gas of atoms and you just look at the kinetic internal energy, you could associate this with an effective kinetic temperature, let's say, of 38 picocurtains. So the, in, in that sense, you can say this is a really, really cold, cool cloud of atoms. Yeah. Uh, here you can see a little bit of a more close-up how this lens also deforms the BEC. And here this circle shows you how the BEC would actually grow in size if it was not lensed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, ah, yeah, we stop here at two seconds. This is simply because we did so far the drop experiments. And in the drop, we take about 2.7 seconds to prepare the mod, the molasses, and then the repetitive cooling to the BEC. And then we have about two seconds left to do all the rest because we have in total 4.7 seconds. Okay, so we could go on here, but for that we have then to switch now to the catapult mode here, where we can go maybe two longer times. And we did some extrapolation, how far we could maybe go uh, there before we lose uh, the, the capability to detect these uh, atoms with, su su uh, with sufficient signal-to-noise. And you can see here from this calculation, this is the case we have in the Quantus II, 10 to the 5 atoms, uh, magnetically lensed, yeah? And the uh, signal-to-noise ratio uh, drops down to a level of 1 after 17 seconds. So this is kind of the horizon which this could maybe reach. Of course, you don't want to work at the signal-to-noise ratio of 1, so you want a better signal-to-noise ratio, and you have eventually to split into different ports, so you have to deduct a little bit then of that, but we are hopeful that we can go significantly beyond, let's say, 2 seconds with this. Yeah. 17 seconds is kind of really the extreme out here. Okay, what did we do then so far? We did investigate a lot, uh, let's say, how the magnetic lens deforms our Bose-Einstein condensate. You can see this here a little bit. You've seen this deformation already on these other pictures I've shown. Uh, we do that by using something like a shear plate for matter waves. We apply a Ramsey sequence, two pi over two pass, shortly after another, another. That creates like two copies of the BC, and then they expand over each other and overlap and form these fringes. And depending on how you focus your BEC that deforms also the uh, velocity distribution in your BEC and leads to these distorted uh, uh, fringes a little bit like in an optical shear plate uh, that you can use to collimate optical laser beams if you are familiar with, with that maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing, of course, we then investigate is we want, of course, to do max Zinder interferometers, these three pulse interferometers. The problem is, if you have three shots per day, you cannot do it the standard way, taking many data points, scanning the face. So what we can do only here at the moment is we use an asymmetric sequence. 
uh, with a little bit shorter separation time here that again produces two copies here uh, and uh, uh, a spatial overlap with fringes that appear in our output ports. And then we look at the spatial contrast in these fringes to see how that evolves if we go to longer and longer times. Yeah. So uh, this is going on now and we are going for longer and longer times. Uh, we see contrast up to 1.7 seconds. Uh, so we are almost at the end of the drop sequence there and eventually we want to then shift to the catapult uh, mode here. Yeah. Uh, analyzing these fringes can be a bit tedious. Yeah. And of course, uh, it, the question is then, of course, also how much does it really tell you about the application where you would have a symmetric interferometer with the, the temporal contrast, yeah? But this is what we can do here at the moment with the low number of, of shots we have, yeah? Uh, the gravity tower, as I mentioned, here we see the uh, uh, Quantus 2 capsule inside this gravity tower. That helps us now to prepare for the catapult. We can do many shots in one day to establish the right parameters and then go to the catapult and hopefully extend now this uh, sequence to many seconds more. Let, let's see how far we will go. And this is interesting because there are several space missions that talk about STE quest now, talks about 10 seconds of interferometer time. Yeah? And this is yet to be shown. Yeah? And we can hopefully maybe show something like this here with the catapult. Yeah? This is uh, the reason uh, why this, I think, is important also. Yeah? OK. Um, uh, how much? Uh, OK. 10 minutes, something like that. Okay, then uh, I will talk a bit more about the other experiments we have here. There's Quantus 1. That used to be the experiment that we used in the drop tower before we started with Quantus 2. Nowadays, it serves as a ground test bed for us. And we uh, use this, have used this to do a couple of things, to study new topologies, new interferometer geometries and beam splitters. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we've shown here how you can create a BSC, so the chip in this case is like this, the BSC falls down and then we can relaunch it uh, with a lattice and have a small, let's say, fountain here to extend the interferometer time in a rather compact uh, uh, baseline here uh, to really use this as a, uh, as a gravity meter in principle. Yeah. Uh, what we have also done is apply beam splitters and lattices, block oscillations, to split the BSC in this direction perpendicular to the uh, free fall direction. And with these block oscillations, we can actually impart a large number of photon momenta. And this is also some work, for example, that uh, Clemens was involved in and Jan Niklas Siems did the simulation to understand this and explain this. And uh, with this, we could form really relatively large Sanyak loops, uh, 2.4 millimeter baseline here, and an area of seven something uh, uh, square millimeters. Yeah in a really compact setup. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is, uh, let's say, uh, some of these things. Uh, yeah, and, and, and the photon uh, recoil difference, the symmetric splitting, the separation is here on the order of 408 bar k on each uh, uh, beam splitter. So this is a record splitting that we have achieved here in this old, let's say, setup. Yeah. Uh, and then you can combine all of this to do uh, more interesting stuff. There's a scheme uh, by uh, Matthias Gersemann here uh, uh, proposed how to use this maybe then in a differential BC interferometer for a compact uh, inertial navigation sensor. And this is now investigated further in the QGyro project, for example, in Hanover. Um, yeah. And finally, I also want to mention uh, that we uh, changed the laser system on this setup recently. Uh, this is work that Ekim, for example, did here on these laser systems. Now we have a laser system that allows us to do both this Bragg and Bloch oscillations, but also Raman uh, transitions. Raman transitions that actually uh, change the internal state of the atom. And this is something that came up just before when we talk about clock interferometry. There have been proposals to do to investigate uh, uh, well, clock interferometry down here is, I think, this uh, sketch is from uh, Albert Rohrer's paper, uh, where you would, for example, use interferometer geometry like this one, where you split your beams, your, your, your BCs, with Bragg block beam splitters, which we can do uh, already. And uh, then you put your atoms in the two arms into a clock superposition state. Yeah? And then you do interferometry with this. And this gives you access to maybe redshift tests uh, to just investigate, let's say, the, the role of proper time here in quantum mechanics. This is quite interesting, I would say. What you need is, of course, large baselines. 
So the ideal, the more ideal place to do this, and this was also mentioned before, would of course be a facility like VLBAI in Hanover, where you have meter separation possibility yeah, to do this, uh, and also long uh, interferometer times, and also actually long, uh, large energy separations. Yeah. So what I'm saying basically, okay, we have a laser system that could in principle do this, but of course we can't implement large baselines here. But we can do some initial, let's say, studies maybe on this uh, uh, topic, and we have some laser system that is capable to, of, should be capable to do that, yeah. Okay, um, what else? Ah, yeah. Uh, I want to then speak about these two experiments that we have over here. Uh, these are kind of local, more local in-house uh, projects. Um, we have seen the apparatus Quantus 1, Quantus 2 that uses these magnetic chip traps uh, so far and they can do very fast evaporation. Um, they are rather energy efficient but of course you always have this chip very close by to your atoms uh, in the vacuum. Yeah? So many experiments worldwide use optical traps, uh, all optical uh, Bose-Einstein condensates in, in cross traps for example and we are also investigating this approach here in the drop tower experiment Primus. Uh, the benefit is, of course, that you can capture your atoms in free space without using magnetic fields. So you have the magnetic fields free for other manipulations, Feshbach resonances, for example. Uh, but the drawback is you need a high power laser typically to, to trap atoms in, in, these, uh, in these traps. Yeah. Well, we have set up this in a drop capsule. So we use a ultra high vacuum chamber and a laser system up here for cooling. And then we use a high power 40 watt, 45 watt, 1064 nanometer laser that we can also drop in the drop tower and uh, implement a crossed uh, dipole trap like, oh, uh, you can't really see, my, oh, this is strange, okay. Yeah, here it's, uh, it's visible, here it looks like a single beam dipole trap, but it's actually a cross here, okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, we recycle the beam and with this we can create a Bose-Einstein condensate all optically on ground very nicely. We have worked to make it fast, yeah, so uh, in an optical evaporation you don't have that many degrees of freedom and it's hard to get fast evaporation. Uh, we managed to get the evaporation now within 1.5 seconds. Uh, this is the phase-based density over time, evaporation time, and we can get to uh, condensation now after 1.5 seconds. We usually like to work more with 3 seconds and that's just about enough to actually do it during the free fall in the drop tower. But uh, in the drop tower, without the gravitational zag, uh, the evaporation dynamics, particularly in the end of the, of the when you have a very shallow trap, uh, changes. And it turns out uh, that without the gravitational zag, your effective trap depth uh, is really a bit uh, different. So you have to actually go to lower laser intensities, and we are already at the edge of the dynamic uh, stabilization range of our laser. So we go from uh, a couple of 10 watts down to uh, milliwatts, yeah, and this is a, a range of 1,000 or more, and then it gets really hard to control the laser uh, uh, intensity here, and and the trap frequencies all the while they get uh, less and less and less, and so you get slower and slower evaporation. So it's hard to transfer what works in three seconds on ground into microgravity, yeah? and this is what we are working on at the moment still, yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing that might help us there is the possibility to also do some uh, uh, fast uh, using time averaged potentials. So uh, the colleagues in Hanover, Henning Albers, has been working on this on ground a lot. So you use a modulator to very fast move your beam, uh, uh, dither your beam, yeah, and then you see on average another potential and you can actually paint some potential, whatever you want to need. You can paint a nice harmonic potential, you can change the dynamics of that potential, so that gives you a, another degree of freedom in addition to the laser power, yeah? and that can help to uh, enhance the evaporation. And it also gives you the ability, so we have now implemented here a 2D spatial modulator, so we can modulate in this and in this direction, and that gives us the ability then also to paint 2D potentials. So this is not atoms, this is just light intensity distribution that we just tested the, the deflector here that we can, for example, then make a potential like this and maybe later investigate atoms in, in a potential like this. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention, this is the, uh, the, the thing that is now in preparation, is 
Okay, we have this high power laser, 45 watts, and nobody is going to uh, buy that we want to send this to space. So you have to get rid of this high power laser system uh, when you do something for space maybe. And one idea to do this, to get there, could be of course you need, you, you take a low power laser system that fits better into a satellite or something. Yeah? And then you, you, you use a, a cavity to resonantly enhance your far detuned uh, optical trapping feed at, at 1064 nanometers. Yeah. Uh, this is a setup that has also already been done uh, and demonstrated not for space applications but for ground applications uh, uh, at, uh, in Bordeaux by a French group and we are currently uh, setting up something similar uh, to that. Uh, so th this is what we, uh, what this would look like and our motivation and why DLR is funding this is of course the technical thing that we want to use a low power laser to uh, do optical evaporation in here. Of course, we then trade power against complexity. Running a bow tie cavity is, of course, more complex and more demanding. So uh, we will see how that works out. And uh, the cavity then is mostly, in the first place, then for far detuned uh, uh, light for trapping. But then we use a dual coating on our mirrors here, so that we also have a high finesse cavity close at 780 nanometers. And this might be interesting then later on. Uh, so I'm not talking about next year, but uh, in, the, in the longer run to do maybe interesting physics, yeah. Cavity mediated, long rate interactions. There's a number of proposals and also a number of people who have done similar things, putting atoms, cold atom species into a cavity and have uh, these uh, collective interactions, cavity mediated entanglement, super radiance. Many things have been proposed and investigated and we will see if some of these things might be possible to do here on ground then probably. Yeah. Okay, so I think my half hour is almost over, so I come to the conclusion. This was a quick run through uh, about what we are doing here at the drop tower and also in the bigger collaboration uh, on uh, cold atoms and matter wave interferometry experiments. So I'm saying that with microgravity, we have the chance to go to the longest interferometer times. We have reached 1.7 seconds in the drop tower and with the catapult, if we say that we need two seconds to repair the BC, we still have seven seconds left. So that's about the scale that we hope to investigate. We will see how good that goes. Um, to do that, we need very cold atomic ensembles. So our BC sorbets have an effective kinetic temperature on the order of 38 picocalvins, yeah, which is really, really low, low energy. Uh, and we're also investigating difficult, different uh, technical uh, um, ways to do that with magnetic chip traps, uh, but also with all optical evaporation. Uh, and uh, we have this Quantus 1 apparatus that I've shown you where we investigate nice schemes with large momentum transfer, beam splittings, novel geometries, and stuff that might lead or might be interesting in the, in the context of, for example, clock state interferometry. Yeah, and uh, with that, I want to conclude again and thank all my collaborators, especially also those one down here from the partnering institutions and yeah, thank you.